First of all, I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us on your Sunday. Um, this is the first of a series of webinars run by the Wonka Young Doctors Movement. Um, we are, um, this one is led by the Vasco da Gama Movement, which is the European network. Uh, we have just asked to run the first one. Uh, the theme for this webinar is riding the second wave of COVID-19. As many of us around the world are facing the second wave of COVID, we hope to share our experiences um, as young doctors um, and our positivity from what we have learned so far so that we can ride this second wave successfully. Um, next slide, please. So just as an introduction, uh, the Young Doctors Movement um, is, May, is a, a Wonka um, uh, network. It's uh, just a run through all of them. Um, you may be familiar with this already. So we have Polaris, which represents North America, Wainake of South America, Vasco da Gama Movement, which is Europe, Afro One, which represents Africa, Al Razi for the Middle East, Spice Root for South Asia, and the Rajakuma Movement for Asia Pacific. Um, and as you can see, each region has um, a leader um, who I've just put their email addresses on here in case you want to contact them. Next slide, please. So for today, the webinar, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, the webinars will be happening every two months, and this is the first one. There will be talks from representatives from each of the Young Doctors Movement networks. And then we will be finishing with questions and closing. Next slide, please. Just a few housekeeping rules. Um, so please ensure that you're on mute at all times if you're not speaking. Um, there are different ways to ask questions. So you can type a question in the chat or in the Q&A box and um, Kerry will be fielding these. You can also type a question in the Facebook chat if you're watching on Facebook and Rocio will pass the questions on. Um, I never have to really make a point of this last one, but um, because it's a good family sort of network that we're part of. Um, but just to remind each one, everyone that, you know, just be, just be kind to each other. Thank you. Next slide. So just to introduce uh, these talks, I just thought I'd start with something a little bit personal to me. So I write a blog called The Global GP Project. And since February, since the beginning of essentially the first wave of COVID, um, I've been interviewing family physicians from across the world. Um, and to find out more about what it's like working with COVID um, kind of in our setting, um, we are all facing the same challenges um, and I wanted to learn more and also share the lived experiences of my colleagues worldwide. Um, next slide, please. So um, I've interviewed doctors from across the world, mainly in Europe, um, but from Italy, Hong Kong, Brazil, UK, Turkey, Taiwan, USA, India, Australia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Spain, Germany, Japan, Australia, Kenya, Kazakhstan and Portugal. Um, next slide, please. And there's lots of things that I've learned through these series. Um, just as a reminder, one of the main things is the fact that primary care looks different from across, uh, looks different across the world. So in the UK where I work, um, we work mainly in the community, but there are countries where family medicine clinics are part of a hospital. Um, sometimes we act as gatekeepers, sometimes we don't. Um, and what gatekeepers are is that we have to be, you have to see us before you can be referred to a specialist. So primary care looks completely different um, depending on where you work. But there are principles of primary care that binds us. So this is a WHO principles, which is that we are the first point of contact, that we provide continuity of care, that is comprehensive, and that we coordinate it as well. But actually, I really think that what binds us and what makes us very similar is the fact that we all practice patient-centered care. So when I've been doing these interviews, the main thing that I've learned is whatever political system we work in, what, whatever um, public health um, implementation that has happened, we are actually all facing the same um, challenges, the same concerns, and actually we all have very similar temperaments. We've all had issues around PPE, especially at the start, and worrying about how to keep ourselves safe. 
We're also humans and that we've ha had to face lockdowns, our own anxieties and social isolation whilst trying to be upstanding members of the community. I've also been really struck by the fact that family physicians are trusted members of the community um, and that we are there to engage with local leaders and individual patients to keep everyone safe, um, whether that's through dispelling myths, correcting fake news, picking up on family violence, even ensuring that people have enough to eat. And also, I really was touched by how much we care about the social determinants of health as doctors. Um, we know that there is a widening disparity of health and wealth during this pandemic. And it was the compassion that my colleagues expressed um, that I was very touched by. So next slide, please, Nick. So we're gonna move over to Christian um, and then we'll be moving straight on to the panelists. Feel free to ask as many questions as you like, um, either on the um, Q&A or the chat, uh, and then we will try and answer them as much as we can. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, I find your results are really encouraging and showing how important we really are and that we should uh, keep ourselves motivated. And um, coping with COVID, as the slide says, you will now hear spotlights from GPs around the globe showing our similarities and differences. And my impression is still that countries tend to solve fresh problems mostly on their own. And now again, would be the perfect time to learn from each other and realize not everything we take for granted is just that around the globe. Just mentioning universal health coverage, health illiteracy or freedom of press. Um, COVID lights our problems and reminds us we as GPs are important and many depend on us. We can push for change and therefore we need to keep our exchange going. This is why we, the YDMs, started this webinar series to listen, to learn, suggest and discuss and to make new friendships and revive existing ones. Because we can't and don't need to tolerate everything on our own. So enjoy the ride. Next slide, please. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Amber Wheatley. I am a family medicine trainee from the British Virgin Islands. And um, I'm the vice chair of Polaris, which is the Young Doctors Movement for the Americas, so North, and, um, North America and the Caribbean and Canada. And I'll be talking mainly about uh, my home country, the British Virgin Islands, but I will do some parallels with Canada and America which will become evident as the presentation goes along. Next slide, please. So the Virgin Islands is our official name, but we've got uh, next door neighbors who are the US Virgin Islands, and they've decided that they are the Virgin Islands, so we're the British Virgin Islands. We're a British overseas territory in the Caribbean, and we're made up of 60 islands, but only four of them are inhabited. Um, the population is about 28,000. We've had some fluctuations in the population since uh, the hurricanes in 2017. So I think prior to that, it was about 34,000 and then there was a mass exodus of people and then people are slowly starting to come back. The country has one hospital uh, and in that hospital, we've got a um, HDU that has about nine ventilators. We've got a limited number of doctors. So our healthcare system is a semi-privatized healthcare system. That means every district has a clinic with at least one doctor in it. But some of those doctors um, also work in private practice and there are some doctors that work solely in private practice. As a result of this, in anticipation of the pandemic, uh, we were part of the recruitment of a team of Cuban doctors who have um, come to the British Virgin Islands to help out. Next slide, please. So this has actually been updated very annoyingly yesterday. So the government has an information team that uh, regularly puts out flyers such as this to let the public know the current status of how we're dealing with the pandemic. So at the moment, we've got um, about 7,000 people tested uh, at the hospital with 73 total cases. One is active at the moment, 71 recovered and one death. Next slide, please. This is where the British Virgin Islands sort of fit in with the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean. So as you can see, we're on the lower end of the spectrum with only uh, 79 cases at the time that this information was put in. The lower number is obviously rated, um, sorry, related mainly to population size, but it's also a reflection of how aggressively the government implemented non-pharmacological methods. And I'll contrast this with um, America and Canada later on in the presentation. 
Next slide, please. So this is a timeline of how we've coped with the pandemic so far. So the pandemic was officially announced on the 11th of March by the World Health Organization. We didn't have the first case, oh, we didn't have the first case in the BVI until March 25th. Um, this was traced back to someone who had actually returned to the BVI from uh, New York. And there was also another traveler who was a BVI native, but from Europe. Um, and that led to a, a small outbreak. As a result of that, the BVI went into its first lockdown as of March 27th. Hold on a moment, please. Right, so we had our first lockdown March 27th to April 25th. And this was a very strict lockdown, so people were not allowed to leave um, their yard. Uh, and we had police patrolling. Uh, we also put in provision for people to try and get food and um, necessary items delivered to them. Um, after April 25th, the curfew then came into place so people could leave their house, uh, but only for a short period of time and only essential businesses were open. So a lot of people were encouraged to work from home. Even the essential businesses had a restricted time so they were only sort of open for half the day. Uh, we then had another outbreak as a result of um, lifting the, the curfew and then we had uh, contact tracing that was done so anyone who had been to a location where a positive case had been found was then invited to do um, sort of a mass testing. Um, and this was as a result of cases increasing from August to September. Interestingly, the case increase at that point was linked uh, mainly to two things. One was that the US Virgin Islands, our neighbors, didn't have as strict a lockdown policy as we had. And as the cases in America rose, uh, it was one of the few places that Americans could travel. So their cases skyrocketed. As a result of the cases skyrocketing, we had quite a few um, illegal immigrants trying to come over from the US Virgin Islands to the British Virgin Islands where they knew that there was less um, coronavirus. Uh, and this highlighted one of the things that I'll talk about later on, which is about our, our border security. So at the moment, uh, we had another lockdown. Uh, we've got a curfew in place and the cases have slowed down. And as of um, October, we haven't had any new cases. Next slide, please. So with the surveillance system, everything is sort of good old fashioned pen and paper. So initially with the nationwide lockdown, there was no mass testing because at that time we only had two active cases. Uh, a medical hotline was put in place where people were triaged for possible symptoms. Most of the cases were managed at home or in the community um, and only in severe cases, they were taken to the hospital. Uh, as the number of cases increased, as I mentioned, uh, we had mass testing for those who had been in contact with a known uh, COVID positive, and that included direct contact as well as being ex potentially exposed. The testing was all done through our clinics, and then they, we set up some community centers where testing could be done as well. Uh, the track and trace is done via the testing centers, uh, and the government does plan to introduce a track and trace app uh, December 1st when our borders officially reopen again. Next slide, please. Amber, I might have to get you to wrap up soon if that's okay. Yeah, that's no problem. So after the first uh, lockdown, the borders were closed to visitors, so you could only access by air transport and all permission has to be requested. The very uh, unique thing about the BVI is that everyone who comes into the BVI, you have to have proof of a negative COVID test three days before entry. You have to be quarantined for 14 days at a designated facility with 24 hour security. And while you're quarantined, you get tested on arrival and on day five. And regardless of your COVID status, you must quarantine. Next slide, please. So all, as I mentioned, um, all of our uh, consultations were through the medical hotline first and then in the, the medical center, mostly done over the telephone. Uh, because it's a small community, the patient's main concern was actually confidentiality. They didn't want people to know that they were positive. Um, and the practicality of self-isolation. So getting food and water to them became a problem. Uh, you only got the tests at the cost of the government if you had symptoms of um, coronavirus or were a known uh, contact. Otherwise, if you just wanted it for your own interest or for travel purposes, it was about 125 um, US dollars for the testing. Next slide, please. So the strength of our primary care is that in many parts of the British Virgin Islands, the primary care is literally the only care, that is the doctor that they know. So there was already a well-established relationship with the community and that made implementing strategies a lot easier. 
and for good or bad, because we've had to deal with a lot of uh, natural disasters such as hurricanes, the government already had a very easily adaptable um, protocol for natural disasters, um, and they just adapted it for the pandemic. So I've just put a little screenshot of the six step uh, plan that they had in summary. Next slide, please. So the lessons that we learned were that having clear information out to the public was absolutely instrumental um, and having a multi-agency approach was also really uh, important. So we used the uh, family support network greatly in, in our response. Um, also having rapid implementation of the pandemic strategies was very crucial. So you can't sort of let, let it sit for a week. Restricting movement uh, with the border lockdown was also, uh, I think, what protected us from having a serious outbreak. And it's also important to signpost people to accurate information. I know a lot of us have experienced a lot of false news going around. Next slide, please. So the lessons that we learned, as I mentioned, was um, about illegal immigration and the border security. And we also, unfortunately, had a local lockdown where some essential workers weren't sticking to PPE, and that led to a, another transmission despite people being locked down. Um, access to food and water also became very challenging. Some businesses uh, you know, use it as a way to exploit pu the public and that led to a lot of mistrust and, and chaos. The, the last thing that I wanted to mention was that the borders are planning to reopen December 1st, but while in the BVI we haven't had that many coronavirus cases, most of our tourists come from Europe, Canada and America. And if they're in the midst of their second wave and having increasing cases, it puts a lot of fear on what will happen when we lift our restrictions. Many other countries have seen that they've managed well with the pandemic, but as soon as they lift the curfew or lockdown, the cases spike, and I anticipate that the BVI will see something similar. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you, Amber. Um, that was really interesting, and also interesting to hear about the BVI, where we, which is a country that we never really hear very much from. So thank you very much for your time. And we're going to move on next um, quickly to uh, Christian, who will be representing Germany. Thanks again, Sonia. Um, yeah, Germany. You know all where Germany is located, I suppose. I forgot to put on a map. So I'm going on quickly now, only five minutes. Next slide. Okay, so Germany initially got a lot of praise because of their good response to COVID. But uh, <clears throat> nowadays we have to consider it might have been luck mainly because we travel a lot and yeah, we had no special measures. Um, yeah, maybe we were simply lucky that we didn't get that many cases. And now we have the second wave like anywhere else, a lot of poo all around the country, 20,000 new cases every day. Next slide, please. Uh, the current state is that we have a soft lockdown in place to stabilize our incidents. Yeah, currently it seems to work. Uh, the initial goal was to get the numbers dropping. Uh, that is uh, not the case. So maybe we'll see stronger uh, measures, maybe a curfew in the end, I don't know. Um, locally, our ICUs are on the threshold to full capacity. But of course, in Germany, we have a lot of ICU beds. We have uh, about 25,000 ventilator beds. But uh, as everybody else, we have problems finding the right personnel for it. We, we are taking the first measures to prepare for vaccination. For example, in my state, we have the first plans coming up where the vaccination centers will be located. Um, then we had a lot of uh, media coverage about <clears throat> protests going on. This is kind of interesting. The freedom of speech in Germany is really a high good, uh, of course, because of our history. And um, we had really crazy protests and uh, against the soft lockdown measures. Um, and we had a special moment two weeks ago, the Sophie Scholl moment, where a young 21-year-old uh, uh, a woman uh, stated she was feeling like um, Sophie Scholl, which was um, actually a um, freedom fighter in the Third Reich, wh who got killed for her work. And uh, she was protesting, escorted by police, and had rights to say whatever she wanted. And now the public um, <clears throat> is more, uh, uh, not, not that much in favor of these protests anymore. Okay, uh, the social impact in Germany is Okay, so far we have a lot of relief programs going on. Next slide, please. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a map uh, of COVID, how it's uh, uh, yeah, uh, 
yeah, the map shows every little state in Germany and the incidents. We have about 1 million cases right now, 20,000 per day. Um, and the engagement with public health for us GPs is that public health just tells us who we should test. And when we test somebody positive, the labs directly report back to public health. And the tracing is mostly done by the public health departments. But since the numbers have grown so substantially, um, the GPs are also involved in tracing now. Surveillance can be done, uh, uh, can be uh, seen online. The Robert Koch Institute is publishing very good data. Um, for example, the slide on the right hand side is from the Robert Koch's page. Um, the tracking is mostly done by GPs um, because we have good relationships with our patients. We try to follow them up. We also have some corporations going with insurance companies where we get reimbursed for our special um, yeah, needs, our timely needs. And there's also some research going on with tracking, but it is rather diverse and not coordinated. Next slide. Uh, protection measures uh, um, are an important point at the moment, which is discussed among GPs. We have arch architectural circumstances, which are really diverse because GPs are normally self-employed and they pff, work in all kinds of buildings, with, which makes it hard to, to, to really um, protect uh, the patients attending from each other. I'm in a good uh, position because we just built a new building and I have a back entrance and we have separate rooms for all infected people, but this is not the case for most, most GP offices in Germany. Um, you will hear more about that if you wanna join the Vasco da Gama movement pre-conference exchange on December 15, short ad, uh, where you can visit three successive uh, GP practices in Germany. Um, yeah, testing. Uh, is being uh, done in the practice at the moment. You can also refer if you can't test in your practice under the right uh, environment. Um, asymptomatic testing is also done for COVID contacts uh, when they can be traced for returning travelers. They have to quarantine and they can get free of quarantine with negative tests. Um, hospital, nursing homes, um, when you enter them, you can also get a free test before and school staff is regularly um, tested or can be tested. Um, Next slide, please. I'm running out of time. Um, the strength in local primary health care is um, mostly the long personal relationship we have with our patients and the growing professionalization in Germany. We have um, professional chairs at all universities. We have a lot of networking uh, communities. Um, um, as we are mostly self-employed, there is a lot of initiative to keep the ship afloat because we, um, yeah, if we don't work properly, we don't get the money we need to pay our employees. The federal system in Germany also developed a diversity of strategies with this, which is good if you want to find the best strategy. But on the other hand, we have um, a lot of miscommunication, mass document production, and we have a lot of differences between the states in what is allowed and what is not. Next slide, please. Silver linings, uh, I want to tell, yeah, we can adapt uh, with GPs, we can react to difficult situations and we can encourage e each other and the patients trust us a lot. Society can also cope with awkward contrarians like our protesters and uh, if you see all these uh, slides here in the presentations, you realize the same world uh, has similar problems and yeah, we can grow together with all our device diversity, which was, by the way, the motto of Fonca 2017. And equity is something that benefits everyone. And I hope when the vaccination is coming around the globe that we will see more equity than we have seen in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, and uh, it's really interesting is when I spoke to you before for my blog, I remember being quite surprised at the federal government in Germany and have, how you, all the different regions had different rules. Thank you. Um, so next is gonna be Dr. Makindore from uh, Nigeria. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Ore Makinde from Nigeria. I'm the General Secretary for AfriOne Renaissance. And I'm going to be sharing with us um, some of what we're doing in Nigeria as we're preparing for the second wave. And I, I believe that this is something of what um, is going on and representative of other African countries. Sometimes I wonder, are we on the second wave already or we're still waiting for it? But I believe most of us believe that we're still waiting for the second wave. So we want to see how are we, 
how well are we prepared to um, cope with the second wave? All right, next slide, please. So it's just um, a few months back, that was in February 28, um, 2020, that we had the news that the first case of coronavirus disease had been confirmed in Nigeria. And um, next slide, please. Where we are now is that um, as of the 27th of November, 2020, we've had um, 246 new cases. And these cases are mostly in, in Lagos and the Federal Capital Territory, which is Abuja. And this is because these are the two international entries into the country, exits and entries into the country. And um, when you look at the total figures, we have um, 67,220 cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria. And um, out of these number, we have um, 1,171 1, who have been lost because of um, the ravaging disease. And this is just, um, this, is, um, this fatality rate is actually less than 0.02%, which is um, just the same as what we're getting in Africa as a continent. Next slide, please. Now, um, some of us would wonder, we, we seem to have a low fatality rate compared with um, other countries all over the world, but we should also look at the number of samples that have been tested. As at yesterday, we've just tested about um, 756,000 samples. We've just had that amount tested. So it's not surprising that we're having um, a lower number of people who are dying from the disease. Um, presently, we have 3,363 active cases. And um, this data is quite important because the mindset of the average Nigeria is that we don't even have COVID at all in the country. And that's the same mindset that a lot of Africans do have. Next slide. So now talking about what we've been doing um, in my own home country, when we first got the um, news that we had a patient with COVID-19. Um, the communities, what we did was to start tracing contacts of that person to the various communities. And this was managed um, by the Nigerian Centers for Disease Control. We also had um, the Lagos State Ministry for Health coming in to do a lot of work in this area. So people were traced to their homes and um, after a while, we had to start community screening as well. Um, but over time, this has dwindled. We've not had a lot of community screening. Most people are screened when they present with symptoms or if they do a self-assessment online and they find out that they have symptoms that are suggestive of COVID-19, then they present to the health facility. Um, most people these days are getting screened because of international travel. And um, that's because before you can go to another country, you have to fulfill the, the requirements by the international health um, authorities and get your COVID-19 test done. Next slide, please. So testing in Nigeria, basically, um, we have approved COVID-19 test centers, and these are majorly um, provided for by the Nigeria Institute, Institute of Medical Research. We have tertiary um, hospitals and accredited private laboratories. Um, but the downside of going to some of these private laboratories is the cost. The cost is so high um, and a lot of people would rather use that money to fund basic supplies at home than to pay um, about 50,000 Naira for um, a COVID test. Next slide, please. So um, talking about public engagement and the protocol so far, we have multiple levels of public health response um, for the federal government, aside from the national um, centers for disease and control. We also have the presidential task force. Um, we have talked about the federal ministry of health and we have a COVID-19 emergency operating center, which caters 
for um, the issues that might arise for people who have COVID-19. And in different um, states, we have uh, public health authorities who are responsible for preparedness and response activities. Um, coming down to the hospitals, I work in a tertiary hospital that's um, the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital. And um, one of the things that we need to do and that is done in several other centers is that we have to triage our patients. We have a, a huge crowd of patients that come to the, the general outpatients and without triaging them, we can't know who is a suspect for the, for the disease. And so um, once we triage using um, a particular chart, then we are able to decide whether this person needs to be referred to have a COVID test. Um, most of the time, like I said earlier, they go to the um, Nigerian Institute for um, Research or they go to a tertiary facility to get this done. We have campaigns that have been organized by the um, Nigerian Centers for Disease Control. They've been at the forefront um, organizing campaigns, um, letting everyone know that they need to take responsibility. Um, if you come to Nigeria now, you see a lot of people without face masks. They believe that this is a political propaganda and that there is um, no COVID in Nigeria. And just um, last week, um, Africa marks the mask week, what we call the mask week. Um, next slide, please. I'll tell us more about that. Making so the Africa... have a minute left, if that's okay. Uh, okay. All right, so next slide. So the basic things that we're talking about during the mask week is everyone wear your mask, um, maintains physical distancing and, and hand washing. And that's basically what we do um, in the hospitals as well. Next slide. So talking about the strengths in primary care, um, the strengths in primary care have to do with the fact that we have um, our frontline staff who work as a team, but um, we still want to advocate that primary health centers in Nigeria should be included in the fight against COVID-19. And that's because we have the potential to detect cases um, early. We get um, real-time information across to our um, patients and we're able to support um, compliance and ensure the continuous provision of health services. Next slide. So what are the lessons um, that we've learned from all of this? Um, pandemic preparedness is an ongoing process, um, whether it's a developed country, underdeveloped, even the, the most, um, the strongest communities were not exactly prepared for this um, um, pandemic. We need to communicate risk with um, people out there, the public, they need to get contacts from the, the, um, the stakeholders and the government, they need to know that this is a risk, this poses a risk to you and to your family so that they can take the appropriate measures to protect themselves. Training and retraining of healthcare workers is key so that they can also pass down appropriate messages to people in their communities and strengthening of the community disease, um, disease surveillance system. The surveillance system right now is quite poor and we need that to be strengthened. The fight against um, COVID-19 requires um, continuous implementation of primary healthcare strategies. And this includes um, access to clean portable water, basic sanitation, hand washing, even basic supplies such as food, which was a big problem during the lockdown. And that was why um, the, the lockdown had to be eased because a lot of people were even dying from hunger rather from, than from the disease. Um, next slide. So I want to thank you for listening. I'll be willing to answer questions as they come up. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really interesting. And I really like the visuals and the public health campaigns as well. They're really beautiful. Um, we're next moving on to Anas. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so, uh, I, I am Anas al muhtasib a family doctor from Jordan. I am the chair of our Razi group. Uh, uh, Jordan uh, is uh, located in uh, the Middle East. So the arrow is uh, actually, after changing the, the presentation, is not here exactly. <laughs> so this is uh, Iran. Uh, it's uh, just uh, to the north of Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, just close to Palestine. Uh, so I'm sorry that the arrow is not in the correct place. Anyway, next please. So in Jordan, we have uh, uh, another story. It is not the second uh, wave, 
we are still uh, facing the first wave. Actually, uh, uh, in Jordan, uh, we the government uh, did a very strict uh, controlling, uh, banning of movement, lockdowns, uh, contact tracing for several weeks. Uh, uh, so we have maintained very minimal number of uh, cases uh, till the um, till the end of August. After that, a breakthrough happened through some of the borders, uh, and uh, the uh, the transmission of the infection uh, started to increase uh, gradually till we reached a community spread level. So we have unfortunately we reached the maximum uh, or the uh, up limit of uh, uh, transmission of the uh, virus in the community. Um, next, please. So um, recently, this is, these are the figures of uh, two days ago, 27th of November, uh, that uh, we have total cases, confirmed cases to about 207,000 cases. Um, with the 2,570 deaths. Uh, so this is a very uh, large uh, number. Actually, uh, some estimates that the actual number of cases is about 10 times uh, this uh, figure because you know that there's some limited uh, number of uh, investigations that we can do per day. So, um, so we are expecting that we have two million infections or uh, one and a half million infections uh, in the community in Jordan. By the way, Jordan uh, the population is 10 million only. So we are talking about uh, 15 to 20% of the population is uh, already infected. Uh, so as you can see, um, we are now uh, maybe at the peak of the uh, first wave. Uh, hopefully the numbers are now uh, uh, plateauing or at, uh, or hopefully uh, come to uh, uh, to become less than that uh, in the future uh, so um, this is uh, the current situation of uh, cases uh, in Jordan next please so uh, actually uh, my focus was on uh, family doctors and uh, uh, primary health care uh, and role in facing the pandemic. So uh, the engagement of family doctors in local public health, actually at individual basis, maybe uh, some uh, of family doctors have some administrative uh, or policy making influence. Uh, others uh, were, in, were involved like me, at least for, uh, in research about this. Uh, other family doctors were involved in uh, telehealth, uh, especially during the uh, long period of lockdown. Uh, so uh, this is an individual uh, experiences. However, on collective basis, um, family doctors were involved in uh, quarantine hotels. So the story here that uh, because there is in the first uh, stage of lockdown, uh, anyone can uh, would come to Jordan will be quarantined at hotels, and so family doctors were involved in uh, providing medical care for them. Uh, also, maybe the most important uh, role of family doctors uh, during uh, the pandemic uh, that to ensure the delivery of essential health services through health centers, uh, either during the lockdown uh, or uh, nowadays also. A, a family medicine residents uh, also have a growing role in curative services for COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients in hospitals. As you know, that first two or three years, they are involved in the wards in internal medicine. Uh, so they are uh, involved in treating those patients. Uh, so, and uh, next, please. Uh, about the, the, I will talk about the surveillance uh, measurement now, actually, because at the beginning, there was a very good surveillance, uh, tracing and tracking of the uh, infected people. Now, uh, the sampling, um, the primary health care centers are, is, uh, are uh, used uh, uh, to, to um, make sampling of patients uh, in, in um, the main uh, or comprehensive centers, uh, which is distributed very well over all the country. 
so people, it's very close to people. They can come to visit the center and uh, um, uh, do the test. Analysis, the analysis of the results is very centralized. Uh, and unfortunately, the follow-up is very limited now, not at the beginning. So what about protective measures? Uh, actually, in the clinics, we have the basic protective measures, face masks, sometimes full PPE, hand washing, keeping sufficient distance with patient. Uh, also, if we need testing, we can do the test at the center. Next, please. So the main, actually, uh, strength of uh, Jordanian system is that uh, we have as, uh, about 676 healthcare centers in Jordan in, 19, in 2019. Uh, 112 are comprehensive uh, ones, uh, large ones. Uh, primary centers, a smaller type is about 377 and a, a, a more smaller uh, centers about 187 called the branch uh, centers. So uh, it is well distributed on uh, the uh, country. Actually, uh, the, the main population is in the middle and another uh, Western area of the country. So uh, this is the main strength of our uh, healthcare system or primary healthcare system. And in fact, the number of family doctors are growing uh, significantly over the last uh, three or four years. So uh, next, please. Maybe this is the final slide. So what are the lessons learned? Uh, we think that more role uh, should be uh, uh, made by primary care centers and family doctors. At least, uh, so this uh, strengthening uh, in the primary care center and family doctors is not uh, used very well. Uh, uh, so um, family doctors can follow up mild and moderate cases uh, through uh, for telehealth for by phone, for example, uh, which will minimize the pressure on hospitals. Uh, this is not done, unfortunately. Uh, also, uh, the family family doctors can be and community workers, uh, family, community doctors can be uh, involved in uh, contact tracing of those infected people to ensure that they are not contacting other people. Uh, another thing that we think that can be used, which is, which is telehealth, uh, so we can treat people uh, apart from coming to the uh, clinics. As you know, that many of our visitors in the clinic are elderly people. Uh, so it's better to protect them. So the finally, what do we need? Uh, actually, we think that maybe the policymakers are not very convinced that primary care and uh, family doctors can play a major role. So I think we need uh, more advocacy about uh, our importance, our role as family doctors and primary care centers, uh, primary care providers in, uh, in the health system at all, and especially in the uh, pandemic. Uh, moreover, uh, we might need more empowerment of, of our family doctors and to uh, build leadership in our family doctors that they will affect the policy uh, makers or policy making in the future. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Anas, and I know that you're at work right now, so thank you very much for joining us um, during a busy day. Um, so next we have Sarin from India. Hello all, I'm Dr. Sarin Guriakos uh, from India. I'm the chair of the Spend Root India movement. Next slide, please. So I think uh, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the uh, <clears throat> cumulative uh, number of cases, uh, which are confirmed cases on the left, on the left hand side of the slide, you can see the uh, death, which happened till date. So India is a very large country with more than 1.35 billion population. And we have 28 states and uh, eight union territories. So our data is definitely large. And next slide, please. So uh, here is uh, just I'm sharing this with thought. On the left hand of, uh, on the left hand side of this uh, slide, you can see the states uh, marked with the according to the Human Development Index. The greener areas are the states with uh, high 
human development index and on the right hand side of the screen you can see uh, number of uh, covid 19 cases so if you look the states with higher number of uh, human development index are having the uh, number of more number of cases maybe because they are uh, more into testing or the other way around the states with uh, lesser uh, human development index they may be uh, under detecting the uh, covid cases next slide please so everybody is telling about the second wave and third wave etc but uh, in india we are currently in the first wave we had our lockdown from 25th march to 31st of may so after that by june first uh, week we had uh, a rise in number of cases and we reached a peak by uh, september and from october we started uh, we ended into the uh, <clears throat> planning phase and currently we are in a stationary phase maybe maybe uh, that is attributed to the lower number of uh, tests initially we used to test everyone but we are, now we are focused more into the symptomatics as well as the high risk contact next slide please so here also these are the daily number of deaths here you can see the death pattern is also following the total number of cases we had our peak now we are into a stationary phase more or less from the last uh, three or four weeks next slide please so again this is the cumulative number of deaths it is on the rise next slide please so this is how we engage our uh, public health system this is how we do our uh, surveillance and tracking so at national level we have national center for disease control we have as i uh, mentioned earlier we have 28 states and eight uh, union territories so we have a state surveillance unit at uh, respective states then we have states are divided subdivided into uh, districts there we have our district surveillance unit and every district is are divided into local self government for every self government local self government there is at least one government institution and the charge medical officer is entrusted with the all uh, public health activities of that particular uh, so that is how uh, the system works and we have our private institutions and we have private as well as government laboratories all these institutions and labs report to district surveillance unit and this is how it works next slide please so again uh, this is how our uh, surveillance system works at every level we have a body to uh, monitor system and it is a bidirectional system we give our inputs we get feedbacks this happens at every level and even at local self government we, we have a uh, the local self government area is further divided into wards or divisions at every ward or divisions we have a, a rapid response team so they will be collecting all the data regarding um, surveillance active surveillance contact tracing and uh, follow up of patients those who are under a domiciliary care and this, is, this also in a uh, works in a uh, two directional way next slide please so uh, these are some of the measures we take to uh, ensure safety and uh, make sure that our all patients are uh, being tracked we have government system as well as the private system and in government for covid management we are mainly depending on the uh, government system for tracking and follow uh, for patients we do uh, telemedicine consultations we have designated fever clinics Uh, as also we keep safe distance at our workplaces also we ensure uh, personal protective measures which can be full pp or uh, partial pp and test as everybody knows we have uh, different kinds of tests antigen tests rt pcr cb net uh, and uh, true net and as of now we are uh, testing all symptomatic patients and high risk primary contacts and vulnerable groups 
and for uh, surveillance for purpose also we are uh, doing random testing and those who are in the high risk group and as i mentioned in the previous slide we get uh, reports from the rapid response group from each wards and municipalities in all country and uh, depending on their reports we do uh, active testing next slide please Uh, this is the regulatory authority for uh, deciding testing strategies, ICMR. Next slide, please. So these are the uh, various types of testing and criteria for testing. We have rapid antigen test, RT-PCR, uh, CBNAT, and uh, recently we have a few more tests added to the list. Next slide, please. So this is the algorithm for uh, COVID-19 test. Next slide, please. So uh, one thing uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, the authorities came uh, to the came to the census that we reach we have to strengthen our primary care, that, and that is the only way to fight the pandemic. So because uh, we have a good reach among the public, and the public uh, the primary care network is so strong in their numbers. And another thing, we have a direct uh, contact with the community so that we can we will be able to convince the, uh, the uh, layman. Also, we, uh, we we can be very influential in each and every community. Uh, I already I explained the structure how uh, the system works in India. So uh, we can reach to the uh, root. Next slide, please. So uh, we are still in the uh, first wave and we are expecting like any other country we are expecting and uh, getting ready for the second wave we are uh, getting ready for the vaccination and we are uh, making our list for getting vaccinated and uh, at the same time we have uh, we have strengthened our primary care and as everybody uh, knows our doctor population ratio is not that good uh, it varies from state to state but uh, on average, we have around uh, 1,500 to 1. So that is our uh, doctor population ratio. So we have to be very judicious while using it. So uh, instead of having uh, tertiary care for everything, we have to strengthen primary care. That is how we will be able to fight this pandemic and the uh, future ones. And we have to incorporate not just uh, the uh, doctors, but we have to in, uh, we have to incorporate the community health providers and the members of the rapid response team in every local self government and uh, divisions of the local self government to fight uh, against this uh, COVID as well as any other pandemic. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saren. And I always find it interesting the use of community health workers um, in sort of pandemics or epidemics in general. So maybe that's something I can ask you later. Um, so we're moving on to our next speaker, Loretta. Um, hi, I'm Loretta. Um, um, I'm from Hong Kong and I'm the uh, treasurer of the Rajiko movement. So um, let's start by seeing some figures and then some updates about the condition in Hong Kong. Well, for the current state of the COVID in Hong Kong, uh, when the, although the topic is the second wave, uh, but actually we're entering into the fourth wave. <laughs> uh, this is the fourth wave uh, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the COVID that we are experiencing. And uh, as from yesterday, we have uh, 84 four confirmed positive cases and with um, four, uh, 80 of them are the, from the local cases, but 27 unlinked, that means we cannot find the, really the, where the, the source of the infection that the patient has contracted on. But unfortunately for today, we have rise to above 100 positive cases already. And that uh, the total confirmed cases uh, are as from, uh, uh, or has already reached about 6,000. And, um, but fortunately uh, for the hospitalized patients, we have only 500 something, but we are expecting a further increase in numbers because uh, in Hong Kong, we admit all the patients with the, uh, the COVID positive cases into the hospital. So whether they have they have symptoms or they are uh, mild symptoms, serious symptoms, or even asymptomatic patients. We, they all 
uh, they're required to be admitted. So we do not have enough beds in that case. So we will need to open up some, we call the community treatment centers that for the mild cases that they will go into. And, um, uh, and for the more serious cases that we will uh, allow the patient to stay in the hospital. And uh, uh, until today, the death rate has increased from 109 um, patients died from COVID already. Uh, that makes up the, uh, uh, the death rate of about uh, the mortality rate of 1.7%. Uh, so the reason of surge of cases was explained by uh, uh, a very famous dance cup cluster that we have made up of more than 400 patients. Um, the people, they uh, violate the suggestion of staying indoors and of um, have putting the mask on. So they went into the dance clubs and um, doing the social dance together without the mask. So it uh, now the cluster has uh, spread around and then to have uh, more than 400 patients. This is the single most biggest cluster uh, up till now in Hong Kong. So next slide, please. So uh, I would like to talk more about our local surveillance program that maybe you, you may be interested of because uh, this is the new regulation that was just enacted yesterday. It was a compulsory testing regulation. Uh, the duration of this regulation will be last for the uh, next 14 days. And that requires all the symptomatic patients attending the medical care that uh, must be get tested for the COVID. And they can either get the testing services provided by the public sector as free of charge, or they uh, can choose to test in the private laboratories, but the patients have to pay by themselves. Next slide, please. And this um, compulsory testing, we uh, we we will do the. I, I don't know uh, uh, how the others the uh, other places that you do the testing, but uh, in Hong Kong, we generally provide the specimen boxes to the patients uh, that they will uh, provide their diplo saliva in the early morning, or they can provide their diplo saliva uh, with two hours of fasting. That means they. Uh, advice not to drink or eat or rinse their mouth two hours before, and then they can provide the different saliva for us. And for younger children, they can provide this two specimen. So we generally, in the outpatient setting, we do not usually do the throat swab or the nasopharyngeal swab to reduce the risk of the infection to the doctors, to the healthcare workers. And uh, this is a typo here, the specimen bottles need to be returned to the specified collection um, stations, collection points within two days. And the results will be available within 48 hours uh, after the return of the specimen. And those uh, test positive will be contacted directly by the Department of Health to arrange for admission of these patients. And for those test negative, they will receive an SMS for the notification of the negative result. The next slide, please. So this component, uh, compulsory testing regulation, uh, the, the doctor in charge will be uh, responsible for uh, issuing the compulsory testing direction to the patient coming to uh, for consultation uh, with the symptoms. And for those fail to comply, they will be subject to a penalty of 2000 Hong Kong dollars. That will be about 250 US dollars. And, for, and then they will be, uh, uh, and then the, the Department of Health will issue the compulsory testing order for those who refuse this testing direction. And uh, for those who still not comply with this, they will be subject to a penalty of um, 25,000 Hong Kong dollars, that means 3,200 US dollars, and imprisonment for six months. So, uh, next slide, please. And uh, the local surveillance program, apart from this compulsory testing services, uh, regulation was just launched yesterday. And uh, we have uh, the contact tracing. So for those, all the positive cases, they will have um, uh, the Department of Health will be responsible to um, get those close contacts to uh, to have the, the test with the either the saliva or the two tests. And uh, this is also compulsory. And, but there is a voluntary testing services for those um, asymptomatic citizens who have good concern uh, they do not have close contacts with the positive cases, but they have to concern, say, those living in the same building with those positive cases, then they are, they can choose to go to some community testing centers or some mobile specimen collection stations or to have the test done. So they can collect, uh, they can get the boxes and provide the specimen for testing. All these are free of charge. So next slide, please. 
So uh, this is uh, about some of the uh, about the uh, testing, uh, the update on the testing. And this is me in my clinic. So this is my PPE, uh, a little bit of the DIY one. Uh, when the when the condition is um, uh, we get more cases, I usually put my uh, face uh, face two. But uh, when the cases uh, go down a little bit, because you know we have the fourth wave, so we have the ups and downs uh, during the. The, the days that uh, it's not that uh, uh, serious, the condition is not serious, I usually put my goggle on. So this is uh, how I look in my clinic. So um, next slide, please. And this is the specimen bottles that we use for collection of the diphthal saliva. And in the patients will be uh, advised to uh, put them, uh, spit out the saliva and into the bottle provided. This is one of the uh, specimen bottles provided by the laboratory, private laboratories. And uh, the patient can return the bottles uh, to the um, to the laboratories and uh, have the the um, test available. And um, and next slide, please. And uh, for the strength of the local primary care, I think um, many uh, there's some very good points have been mentioned by the others. But just look at some statistics we have in Hong Kong. Uh, this is uh, the statistics I obtained from the foot wave. Uh, you can see that enhanced surveillance for hyperkinetics that means. Um, uh, the clinics, uh, I mean, that people have symptoms, they have to, uh, they go to the clinic, they will get tested. So the percentage positive rate is a 0.84%, which is very good when compare that with those in the uh, public um, clinics, in the public outpatient clinic, or even uh, quite comparable to the inpatients for, because all patients with pneumonia or influenza-like illness uh, that admitted to the hospital, they will get tested with the COVID. So uh, we are quite, um, we got quite good positive uh, detection rate. Um, um, yes, next slide, please. And um, for non-employment from COVID, um, what I learned from is um, um, very importantly, if we have some small groups of our doctors, we can have the keep update with the latest uh, public health issue. It is very important for us uh, to to know about the, uh, the how the everything because uh, the information flowing very fast every day. Uh, the just like the the compulsory testing regulation that I discussed uh, before, uh, it was just um, uh, within three days. Uh, it was launched within three days, so we get prepared with all these um, uh, uh, the computer system and then uh, collection of the specimen bottles and then everything within three days. So it's very important for the um, doctors, but we can have good communication and then we can discuss and to learn from each other. And it's also important for the small group that we can have mutual support from each other. Um, uh, the very important point I think uh, that I learned from COVID, because you know, Hong Kong is um, a little bit special. We have uh, experienced SARS 17 years ago. So people has a more um, awareness, uh, better awareness of the disease uh, prevention. So uh, the, still the very important thing is that uh, we, if we can have better education of the patients on wearing masks, hand hygiene. I think this is the single most important thing uh, in, in when we face any kind of um, um, pandemic, any kind of um, uh, disease that uh, the patient education is most important. And um, I think all over the world, uh, GPs are, are overworked. People as mentioned in the, in the chat box center. And so beware of burnout. And um, yes, this is uh, uh, what I would like to share today. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. I'm always jealous when I hear about the advanced technology from Hong Kong and your robust <laughs> tracing system. <laughs> Thank you. And last but not least, we're moving to Mariano from Argentina. Hey, everyone. How are you today? Um, thanks a lot for inviting us to be part of this event. Uh, as Sonia said, my name is Mariano Granero. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And what I bring you today to share with you is the first learnings we are starting to have in Latin America uh, with the pandemic of COVID-19. Next, please. So if we are going to speak about Latin America, I think it's the most important is to give you two main features that we have here. One of those is uh, the heterogeneity is one of the main features in Latin America, which means it's, it, this is regarding culture, history, people, nations, the, the city and the countryside. It's like 
huge difference between different countries and even inside the same country in different regions of the same country. And um, this is important, not because of the culture or the history, but because uh, it's, as I am speaking about Latin America in general, you should keep in mind that this heterogeneity is uh, also implied when it comes to diagnosis and approach of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in Latin America, you will find countries with mass testings and countries with no testing at all. And uh, you, you will find countries with uh, severe and strong and strict lockdowns and countries with no lockdowns out, at all. So it's very difficult for us to make conclusions and compare different countries because the strategies have a, no very like, uh, uh, just a little points in common. The next, please. <clears throat> and the second feature you should keep in mind is that Latin America has a huge social inequity. So you, you will say it's like, okay, why, why is this important for us? And it, it is, it's super important because what you can find here is that uh, when I mean social inequality, it's like um, Latin America is not a poor region. We have a lot of resources, we have a lot of science, and we have a lot of education. But the problem we have is that the access to those resources is not the same for everyone. So I think this picture is from Colombia, but uh, you can find this kind of a scenario all along Latin America, no matter where you go, you will find like people with a lot of resources living like, I don't know, 50 meters away. Like in this case, people <laughs> with uh, swimming pools in their balconies, like living like 30 meters away from people who has no access to clean water to drink. So next, please. So what I can tell you is that no matter these differences between the countries, what I can give you a general idea of Latin America is that uh, we had also a later beginning like Hong Kong and Jordan. Uh, so we are still riding the first wave. We had the first case at the end of February, almost March of 2020. And it was in Brazil, but of course it spread weekly. And by the end of uh, March, the beginning of April, every country in Latin America had at least one case reported. And the other feature that the epidemic curve has in Latin America is the somehow um, this curve seems to be a little bit more flat. So that's, uh, that implies a late peak for a later peak for most of the countries. But of course, it means a longer period uh, for the first wave. That's one of the reasons why, why people here is experiencing since the, the first wave and why people here is somehow exhausted with the pandemic. So next, please. So what I'm going to share with you today is uh, four learnings we had from the pandemic so far. The first one is that somehow we mistook the part with the whole. And when I say this, what I mean is that the part is the COVID, of course, and the whole is the health of the people. Somehow, I don't know why, what happened in, the, in our way, but somehow COVID seems to be the only things that matter regarding health. It's like uh, the, the only things that we pay attention to is that uh, you don't get infected by COVID. Uh, next, please. So that led us to COVID center strategies and everything we pay attention to was um, to avoid people getting infected by COVID. But next, please. That brought us a big problem regarding non-COVID conditions that uh, we didn't pay attention to when, since uh, uh, resources are not endless, when you give resources to something, you take it away from some other thing. So uh, when we focus so much on COVID, uh, we turn our backs to psychological problems to social problems, poverty related problems to um, a lot of problems. So next, please. Not only we had a COVID center strategy, but we also moved a lot of resources from the primary care system to the hospital. We had a hospital center response, which means that, uh, next please. You know, primary care is at both sides of um, it's a both sides of this wall, but of course, the lack of primary care 
is, uh, it has a bigger impact when it comes to the left. It has a bigger impact when it has to do with uh, more vulnerable uh, population. Next, please. So this brought us something we, uh, that uh, we already knew. Uh, and this is uh, the less primary care we offer, the, the more vulnerable the population is. And this brings the next uh, learning. Next, please. It's like, why did this happen? And it has to do with primary care is not a priority for many of the decision makers here in Latin America, because the primary care is related to a lack of prestige and um, some people, and especially the, the decision makers, they think that what we do somehow is not important for population. They think that the difference is made in hospitals and fancy hospitals with a lot of technology. And that's a, a big problem for us, at least in Latin America, because so far here, we have a little development of the primary care. So next, please. If you keep this in mind, we can go to the third learning that is, of course, that uh, next, please. We need to take the primary care to develop to its full potential. So you, you can say, next, please. Okay, we know that and you will hear it's complicated. Uh, it's, you will find a lot of people telling you this cannot be done. Uh, the, the, comp the, the system is super complex and we have a lot of problems and no one cares about primary care in, in the politics maker. So I think it's time for us to stop, to stop thinking like this and start saying, of course we can and turn from we cannot do it to how can we do it? So next, please. I think the, the, the fourth and the last learning we had is that so far people tell us that uh, we need to work harder so we can change this reality, so we can give access to the health system to vulnerable population. And I think that's a mistake. I, next, please. What we need to do is not to work harder. What we need to do next is to work smarter. What we need to do next, please, is like the, the I, I really hope you're familiar with the story of the fly and the window. If you're not, it's going to take me only 10 seconds to get you through it. It's like uh, imagine a fly trapped in a room and she's trying to escape and she smashes herself against the glass. So we tell her, you need to try harder. You need to try harder. But the, this story is about the, the window is open a little bit like at the other side of the window. So the fly, what she needs to go out this room is to pull her back and get the big picture and it works smarter. What she needs to do is to work smart. If she gets the big picture, she will find out and the, the way out of the room and she can, weigh, she can walk the way out without smashing. And what we are doing, at least in Latin America sometimes, is that we are smashing ourselves against the system. So what we need to do is the same. We need to pull ourselves back and get the big picture and play the game. If we wanna win the thing and change the reality, what we need to do is to play the game and win this thing. I couldn't agree more with Dr. Anas from Jordan, who's, uh, who spoke about the role of family doctors. I, I couldn't agree more because uh, no matter where we are, um, if we keep in mind that the, the less primary care we offer, the, the more some vulnerable people suffer. Uh, I don't only, not only I think we should change the, this reality. I think we must change this reality. We have to make this happen as next generation of family doctors. We, we can do this. So this is me for now. Thank you a lot and thanks for your time. Thank you, Mariana. That was a really excellent presentation that summarizes uh, essentially what we were all talking about. So thank you for putting it in such an understandable and succinct way. Um, so that's the end of our panelists. I'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone for such an informative talk. We are going to have about 10 minutes of questions. Um, and thank you very much for everyone popping them on the um, chat. Kerry, can I get you to maybe ask one of the questions and then we'll get um, a couple of the panelists who um, would like to answer. 
Yeah, so there's been lots of good um, questions and, and things going on in the chat. Um, one question was around um, well-being and compassion fatigue. Um, so we're all working really hard during COVID. Um, has anyone noticed sort of compassion fatigue happening within their country and how are they dealing with it? Does anyone want to answer that question? <laughs> Any volunteers? I mean, I just uh, wrote a piece about it on the chat. Uh, definitely, this is the case. Uh, we are all getting fatigued. <clears throat> and from my perspective, this uh, is mainly dealt unofficially in small groups of GPs and friends sharing their experiences and encouraging each other. I think if you have a good group where you can share your problems, um, then you're already in a really good state. anybody else want to um, volunteer any perspectives on that? I just want to add a few, add a few sentences uh, to that. Uh, actually, theoretically, we have uh, we have a system of uh, professional professional mental support to uh, get uh, rid of these uh, fatigue and all. But how far these can be effective, I'm not sure because uh, irrespective of all these consolations and uh, counseling and all, we still have to work. So really hard to say how to or come that uh, I don't know, but we have a system of uh, uh, support through uh, uh, phone calls, and uh, which can be uh, they uh, they will follow up basically. That's the plan, and we have uh, peer groups to support each other. But. Uh, as I already mentioned, how much uh, all these can be effective? I'm not uh, that sure. Any other questions, Kerry? Yeah, so we've got a question sort of about moving forward. I think Christian and Sarin both mentioned vaccination and there's been a lot of um, news about vaccinations recently. Um, so questions about how your country is, um, is there any preparation for vaccination and how it will be rolled out um, and who will get vaccinations? Yeah, I can start. <laughs> Actually, we as GPs in Germany are not uh, on the front line of getting informed. So I uh, transcribed something from a government letter that was sent to my wife, which uh, she works in nature conservation. I don't know why she gets it and I don't. Um, we have um, vaccination center planets here in Germany. The government seems to opt for the minus 70 degree vaccinations. So in the first stage, um, they want to establish WAC centers, two to three centers uh, per administrative region. Uh, and they want to vaccinate uh, over a thousand people per day in these uh, centers. And later they want to establish centers on county level as well. And construction of the primary centers should be finished by the 15th of December. And they want to start vaccinating in January. They're still looking for personnel. And I think that's the, the worst part about it because where do you get the, all the people to, to vaccinate? They want to uh, activate retirees. I don't think they will get a substantial quote of retirees to work in vaccination centers. Uh, later, they also want to establish GP practices, uh, but of course they need a different kind of vaccines there. And they want to establish mobile teams, especially to cover the nursing homes. Okay. What did I write there? Oh yeah, one important point might be to identify the legit legitimates for the vaccination. Yeah? And of course, I think this will fall back to the GPs, which could be a duty which involves a lot of stress for us in the future to say who gets vaccinated and who doesn't yet. Okay, and I, of course I'd like to hear from Hong Kong <laughs> because they seem to be on the forefront of technology. <laughs> I don't think we are really that really advanced in the technology. People are always saying that we are far behind. But uh, but uh, for the vaccination, I I we I don't think we have a really uh, very organized plans on because we do not know how many vaccine stock that we will be able to get. Uh, for the we are expecting maybe in the 
after the second quarter or in the third or fourth quarter that before we can get the vaccine. And uh, you know, people in Hong Kong they're quite um, uh, they have uh, always have the the what should I say? They will have uh, the the question whether will it will it be really uh, useful to have the vaccine. So even if the vaccine is available, I will have the doubts if the people are will say, hey, hey, I will go for the vaccine first. You know, Hong Kong people are always like that. They don't feel they they will have uh, their own. Well, they have own ideas and they, they, they will feel that maybe just I wear the mask, it's quite okay. So they may, they may not be that um, uh, uh, enthusiastic in having the vaccine, but uh, still we do not have any, uh, any programs, any ideas about um, how we are going to uh, launch the vaccine program because uh, we don't expect the vaccine to be coming to Hong Kong in the next six months. So this is uh, what uh, our thinking. So. I, and I don't know whether how, how you see about the vaccine, the efficacy, the safety, because uh, in Hong Kong, people are always discussing about this. And our, uh, our experts, uh, the microbiologists, and they will also say that, well, maybe even if the vaccine is available, we still need to be very careful. We still have to be very careful about the preventive measures, wearing masks, hand hygiene. And they really do not really have that, that emphasize it. And the size on the uh, on the vaccine, so uh, we'll just wait and see. Yeah. If I can comment, please. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, so in Jordan, actually, we don't know uh, to what extent do we need a vaccination actually, uh, because uh, we the number of uh, cases is growing dramatically, and uh, maybe we might reach some sort of herd immunity before the need of uh, vaccination or the. Uh, 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 arrival of the vaccination. Anyway, there is there are some uh, plans uh, to to provide the vaccination for uh, uh, the priority for uh, healthcare workers, uh, and uh, the uh, main uh, the primary care centers will take the main role in providing the vaccination for the public, especially for the elderly, as a second uh, priority. Thank you. Um, is there a final question there, Kerry? Um, yeah, so we had a question. Um, a common theme seems to be about misinformation. Um, and I think McKinsey touched on that quite a lot. So are there, where do we think the misinformation is coming from in your country and how are you combating that? Uh, if I can participate, actually the misinformation is very huge, uh, maybe because uh, you know uh, the society itself has been fatigued uh, after the strict lockdown and measurements of the government, uh, and uh, uh, so many wrong ideas uh, raising uh, uh, some now and uh, uh, even uh, so. We, there are many uh, trials to, to uh, counteract these uh, mis misinformations uh, from doctors, from the government, from media, uh, uh, either formal or non-formal uh, efforts to, to, to change the wrong informations uh, in the public. Uh, still, we have many people don't think that there is a pandemic till now, so, uh, but, uh, Actually, on the other hand, many people are taking the issue very serious because they are seeing their relatives, their neighbors are dying due to the uh, virus. Maybe this is the most uh, significant factor that Mariano. I, I couldn't agree with Anas again more because it's like a misinformation is a huge problem also here. It's like, a, um, and it's a big problem when it comes to the media, but it's a big problem when it comes to the uh, social networks with people sending like uh, like uh, stuff in, in WhatsApp and their social medias. And it's also a problem with the scientists and it's also a problem with the politics like uh, creating like um uh, i don't know like it's not false expectations but not correct at all so 
what we do is like our role. We, the family doctors, we are, uh, we ha we are trained to read the evidence and criticize the evidence. So maybe it's our role to communicate that evidence properly. So I, I didn't think I, when I spoke about the, the role of the family doctors and even more, we, the young family doctors, we need to bring this information properly to the population. It's our role. Uh, we cannot ask uh, some, uh, some other specialties that are not uh, trained to criticize the, uh, the evidence, to communicate the evidence. So that's our part. That's our strength, you know? It's like, uh, I think it's on our hands to communicate, to communicate properly this, this information. But first we need to read it and we need to criticize it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all the, um, I think we'd better start to close up because we've been going on for quite a while now, but um, I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists for being so easy to work with and also for giving fantastic presentations today. Um, Nick, do you mind just sharing my closing slides, please? Um, and I, I guess the take home messages from what I've learned from everyone is just how primary care is integrated um, in the community and how we have a really good understanding of our population and our understanding of inequity and um, even the vaccination um, uh, sort of questions at the moment, the answers to the vaccination question indicates that we really know that there may be a, an up, a, a, a problem with uptake, um, just, it just shows how well we know our own communities. Um, follow, following from, from this webinar, um, as I mentioned before, there are going to be further webinars with the Young Doctors Movement. Um, obviously, pre-COVID, the ways to stay connected was the FM360 exchanges, where you can visit another country across the world through the Wonka network. And um, obviously, we, had Wonka, we did have Wonka World Abu Dhabi planned, but that's been postponed to the end of next year. And there are regional conferences as well. I've put everyone's uh, contact details here in case you want to learn more about your own local network. Um, next slide, please. Um, we've also been talking a lot about well-being, and you know we have all been working very hard and also relentlessly, and many of us without a break. Um, as Christian mentioned earlier, we are not alone. Um, it's better to stay connected, and we can learn from each other and stay energized from each other. So I just really want to um, highlight the Wonka YDM group on Facebook. Um, it's on social media. There's also regional um, Facebook groups as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a bit more Europe specific, but um, we are having Berlin um, Wonka Europe um, in um, next month uh, on December the 16th. Um, and obviously we have the pre-conference for young doctors, uh, which is uh, the day before. Next slide, please. And then next slide. And then um, this is something that's again personal to me because uh, we're the UK team are holding uh, the seventh Vasco da Gama Forum, which has again also been postponed to January 2022. And these are our social media networks because we will be running an online uh, two hour event, which will be uh, fun. Um, on the 6th of uh, February 2021, which is everyone across the world is welcome. It'll be online and it's at lunchtime Europe so that everyone can join. Um, next slide. So all that's left for me to do and say is to thank you to all the panelists that are involved, all the YDM leaders who helped us make this a reality, um, to Christian who um, volunteered himself to help me on this, uh, to Harris, um, who is the CEO, the new CEO of Wonka World, um, who uh, gave us a lot of technical support and the use of the Wonka Zoom um, platform. Um, and also our helpers, Kerry and Rocio, who are um, furiously looking at the questions um, behind the scenes. Um, so just to say thank you to everyone. Um, have a really good Sunday and thank you for sticking with this all day. Or well, not all day, but bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye, -bye. Thanks for Thank joining. You. Hope to see you have, soon. Yeah, have a nice day.